what really got me about this story was, uh, you know, not only the not only the obsession and the names, it was how everything was connected. How you know Bill Smith, who, was, who may have caught the first bonefish in the Florida Flats, is connected to Stu Apt, who's connected to Billy Pate, who's connected to uh, you know to Tom McGuane, who's connected to uh, who, who Nathaniel Linville and, and David yeah. Mangum. I mean, it's this it's this continuum which I didn't know actually going in how connected all these things were and of course to me the centerpiece anyway was the those incredible years in Homosassa when you could argue that you had the world's best fly anglers all in the same spot at the same time for roughly five years all after all in the pursuit of the same thing this is Monty Burke and welcome to the Tom Rowland podcast Bonnie, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm hanging in there. How about you? Man, I'm doing great. I uh, I got to say, I I got an early copy of your book and I read it and I I loved it, man. It was it was Good. it was an incredible book. I mean, that that little world. I guess you have all kinds of little worlds like that, but that one of the world record tarpon um you know, both the anglers, the guides, the the whole deal is just almost stranger than fiction, right? I know. <laughs> I love these little these little you know niches. These little obsessions are well, so fascinating to me because a lot of people think they're kind of naive, right? They're like, oh, who cares about catching the world record tarpon, or who cares about collecting rare books or anything like that? But if you really if you really think about it, it's these little obsessions that kind of make the world kind of go around. You know, give they give meaning to people's lives and. It's just, I don't know, they're, they're always fascinating to me. Well, Every book I've ever written has been about obsession. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is because you you have written, um, well, first of all, you've been a staff writer at Forbes, and now you're writing for Garden and Gun and the Drake. Um, then you wrote a New York Times bestseller about uh, Nick Saban, which is yep. amazing. I'd love to talk to you about that too. <laughs> um, and then another one, Fourth and Goal. Then here's two others about strange weird little worlds that that are closed off to so many sow belly and leaper sow belly being the world record largemouth bass pursuit which is yep i already know that's full of interesting characters and people trying to do it the right way and people trying to game the system and i i can't i, I i'm gonna read that book ne next because i really liked your writing style it was it was great for this one that you wrote, Lords of the Fly, which I love the name too, Madness, Obsession, and the Hunt for World Record Tarpon. I mean, for me, I was reading about all the all my heroes, right? Like all these people. I mean, Steve Huff, I used to put in at Sugarloaf right next to Steve Huff, and I would just watch, I would just watch him. Like, okay, like what is he doing? <laughs> And, and what do I need to do to be anything like that? And one of the things that I would watch him do would be he'd do pull-ups on the, he would walk over and do these pull-ups. And I was like, man, I guess you need to be strong to be a fishing guide. I don't know. That was part mm -hmm. of my, part of my obsession into fitness, I think started, started there, but just everyone, everybody that, you, you know, has a, a history in the fly fishing world for tarpon and saltwater um, you just told these really, really interesting stories and there was so much back history that I'd, I had kind of heard about, but I didn't really know how it all worked out. Mm -hmm. But how do you, how do you pick these, these strange little niches? I just, you know, like I said before, I'm just so fascinated by obsessions and people who are obsessed and who do these things that other people think are just, you know, when I, I mean, I live in Brooklyn. So when I tell people about tarpon fishing, they're like, what, what is that? Or if I say, I want, I'm going permit fishing. They're like, wait, don't you buy the permit to go fish? Like yeah. they're all confused. Right. So they don't, and yet all, everyone here also has their own little obsessions as well. So I'm just, I've just always been fascinated by, by that. And uh, what was cool about, you know, those guys in this, in this book are, are also my hero, you know, my heroes, the guys I, I grew up reading about and, and emulating. And I've, been lucky enough to meet a lot of them. But uh, what was really cool about this story, I, first of all, after writing the, uh, so I wrote Sow Belly many years ago, 2005, I think it came out. And then I did some uh, football coaching books and my editor and agents were all like, 
you got it now. Like that's great. <laughs> you're let's, you're let's on the right on path. Yeah. Yeah. Let's stay on that. <laughs> and so, um, when I went to my agent and I said, look, I got this story that I just, I have to tell it, you know, and then he was like, Oh, okay. But well, whatever. But he was great about it. But still there's a, you know, there's a, there's a bigger audience, I guess, for the Alabama football coach. Well, of course than there is for, for Tarpon. But I do think, I mean, what, what really got me about this story was, uh, you know, not only the, not only the obsession and the names, it was how everything was connected, how, you know, Bill Smith, who was, who may have caught the first bonefish in the Florida flats is connected to Stu Apt who's connected to Billy Pate, who's connected to, uh, you know, to Tom McGuane, who's connected to uh, who, who Nathaniel Linville and, and David yeah. Mangum. I mean, it's this, it's this continuum, which I didn't know actually going in how connected all these things were. And of course, to me, the centerpiece anyway, was the, those incredible years in Homosassa when you could argue that you had the world's best fly anglers all in the same spot at the same time for roughly five years, all after all in the pursuit of the same thing. And, you know, that to me just alone is fascinating. You had Stu Apt, you had Billy Pate, you had Ted Williams was there for a little while. You had Tom Evans, you know, you had guides like Steve Huff and Dale Perez and uh, uh, Bill Curtis and all these, these legends, right. All there at the same time. And that, that to me was really fascinating. Now what went on there to me became even more fascinating the more I looked into it. I mean, it was, the competition was intense. Um, you know, there was, they were fairly cordial, uh, you know, on the water with each other. Uh, and then there were all sorts of vices that kind of were swept in with the tide, which I mean, made it even more interesting. You said, and then it, you then said, it just exploded. Yeah. Well, I mean, you said they were cordial on the water. I mean, kind of, you told yeah. a story about, uh, mixing up fiberglass and, and pouring it on, on <laughs> someone's boat to where nothing worked and you couldn't get a hatch yeah, open. You couldn't get the, you couldn't move right. the steering wheel. I mean, yep. that's pretty serious. Plus, um, you know, sinking boats and all of that and slashing tires and the whole, yep. the whole it's deal for people. You know, the tarpon world in particular seems to be to be a very kind of like, you know, competitive, uh, area. Well, it's, it's in, competitive, in but you, 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 you painted that picture really well. Like if you were a new guide and you came into an area like that, you could, you could play ball and not get in anyone's way and everybody'd be fine with you. You know, yep. they wouldn't talk to you probably. And, and, uh, you know, it would be kind of uncomfortable, but they wouldn't slash your tires. But if you, you know, wanted to jump in front, you know, a hot keys guy coming up there and you want to jump in front of somebody, that was going to be the end of it. And, yep. uh, oh, man, I mean, you just painted that picture really well and it's not like that anymore. Um, but when I first got to Key West, it, there was, there were remnants of, of that, you know, and there yep. were certainly stories of, of yep. sinking boats and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So when you, um, you know, this is kind of, um, any of these worlds, the, the, I mean, all of them, the Atlantic salmon world, the, the largemouth bass world, Nick Saban's world, and then this world of, of the large, of the, uh, world record tarpon, they're kind of closed off. And like you painted that picture too, like these guys were booked for, for life. You couldn't get in there. So yep. how do you get, first of all, you have to be a fisherman, uh, like from way back to understand this world well enough to, to even navigate it and, yep. and, and find these stories and then meet these people. How did that happen for you? Um, so it was, it was actually really interesting. I did a, um, garden gun assigned me a story on Steve Huff about a decade ago. And I knew who Steve Huff was, but I didn't really know the totality of Steve Huff. And I went down there and we spent uh, two days on the water and hit it off. And it was just turned out to be a fantastically fun story to do kind of from be beginning to end, from the reporting to the writing. And actually they titled the piece, the world's greatest uh, fishing guide, I think, which is, you know, I fully agree with like just an incredible person, incredible guide. And so um, I, Steve Huff had a static number of clients every year. He had that 11 or 12 people and that was it. I mean, he would turn, uh, George, uh, uh, HW Bush, um, asked him if he could take him fishing. And he said, no, because he had another guy booked. And so by some sort of miracle, I forgot who the client was. One guy dropped out and another guy said, Hey, you should take that guy, that guy, Monty. He really, you know, he's really into tarpon fishing and all kinds of stuff. So Steve was like, sure. So from that point on, we started fishing every year together. And, you know, we would sit, we would fish all day and then we'd come home and, and eat dinner. And he would oftentimes kind of start to tell stories about Homosassa. 
which I just love. The, I mean, the name to me is very poetic and kind of magical. Yeah. And the stories he told, uh, you know, about Tom Evans, about Billy Pate, about Stu Apt, about Ted Williams, you know, about riding in the car with Ted Williams to go to a fish shack, you know, and like almost running into another car. I mean, it, it, these stories just sort of started to populate my head a little bit. And then a couple of years after that, I was lucky enough, Garden Gun again sent me down to do a story in the Keys with Andy Mill. And uh, <clears throat> I had a great time hanging out with Andy and his son, Nicky, and kind of teaching, you know, talking about his career and all that kind of stuff too. And so we kind of hit it off. And I think it was two years ago or maybe three years ago now when Andy called and said, hey, man, these guys aren't getting any younger. who were in Home Sassa. You know, he knows, <laughs> Andy knows Tom Evans very well. He was like, you know, I got the guy who can, you know, maybe be your main character and kind of bring you through the whole book. Um, you got to do the story. You got to promise me you'll do the story and you'll do this book. And so, you know, at the time I was sort of like, well, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe I, I might do another football coach book or whatever. But then I started thinking about it and thinking about it and talking to Steve again. And it's just a story that I couldn't, I couldn't not tell. I, I'd be depressed if I hadn't taken the time to, to go through it. And then it was just a matter of finding, you know, it was fun. I mean, it was like, going to see Chico Fernandez and sitting down and having three hours with Chico talking about fishing to go hang out with Stu Apt. You know, it, it was just really a magical thing. And then actually to go to Homo Sasso, a place that I had read about a lot and heard a lot about and spend a lot of time there. I mean, I spent probably the equivalent of a month there over two seasons and just kind of see the scene and see how beautiful that flat is and how difficult it is, how deep it is, all those big black rocks in there. And then occasionally see one of those big fish. I mean, they're not really around like they were obviously back then, but every once in a while you see what you see something swim by and you're like, holy crap. I mean, it like literally your knees start to buckle a little bit. So, <laughs> and then to do all that and then to go, you know, hang out with the new guys, with the new people on the scene, with the David Mangums and then Daniel Linville's and, um, you know, it was just so fun. And then to realize, you know, as you, this is one of the cool things about reporting and, and writing that, uh, people might not understand is that you go in sort of with an idea and then, and then the reporting takes you on the journey. Yeah. And this, this reporting happened to, to tie everything together. I mean, there's a great checkoff quote and I'm going to murder it, but it's uh, it's in the book, but you basically, if you shake one end of the story, the other end shakes, you know I mean? Yeah. There's like, there literally is this continuum from, uh, you know, the earliest tarpon fisherman all the way to, to today. And it was just, I don't know, it was just really cool. I never really knew that it was all connected like that, all interconnected like that. It was just so awesome. Yeah. So the way that you, that you told the story, you, it required you to get a tremendous amount of history, like going all the way back to the first bonefish caught on fly and who, who might've had something to do with that. And then, you know, like Jimmy Albright and then the sisters that were, that were the the guiding. I mean, I I found that really interesting that guiding started out kind of, uh, it seemed like it was female dominated at one point. And then, uh, and then, you know, Jimmy Albright marries one of the girls and then, then it kind of takes a, takes a turn, I guess. But, uh, some of this history, like I had heard a lot of these things, I mean, throughout the whole book, so many of the stories that you told, I had heard parts and pieces of those either on the skiff or like anglers talking about it, kind of like you're talking about, like, mm-hmm. and, but then your book put it all together in a certain way that I had never, I mean, really well, like you put the whole puzzle together and before right. there were all these missing pieces and everything. And it was just such a great history just of the sport of fly fishing, not necessarily of the sport of fly fishing for world records. But it yep. was just super cool the way it did. So when you decide this is going to be a book that you're going to write and you have plenty of other opportunities, like you could do another football coach book. Mm-hmm. What kind of commitment is that? Like, do you think, OK, well, this is going to take a year or two or like what what kind of commitment do you make when you're going to tell this story? So usually I um, I like to have about between 14 and 18 months to do a book so that I try to split it into like half of that time I'll spend reporting. And then I like to come home to my office and, you know, that's when I grow the beard. You know, that's, that's when I stop, uh, you know, some of the personal hygiene stuff and you just dive completely into it. And both sides are really fun. It's really interesting to me. Uh, you know, the, the reporting part is very extroverted, right? You have to, you have to talk to people and you want to get their story. So you've got to be kind of welcoming and you got to be able to ask the right questions or you hope anyway. 
Um, and, and then the writing part is like the most intro. I mean, I'm literally like Ted Kaczynski, you know, I mean, not without the, without the horrible <laughs> stuff, but like, I, you know, I have like my, my kids are always like, dad, are you okay? Like, I'm just like, cause then everything, you know, this happens when you're reporting and you're writing, but ev- literally everything you see relates somehow, like I'll be walking through the park and see a tree and I'll be like, that reminds me of something. I mean, the, in the book, right. Everything you read, you're like, Oh, that's interesting. Maybe I could throw, maybe that idea resonates somewhere. But it's a it's just a super fun process. So I try to do, you know, I try to get at least 14 months with these things if I can. Uh, I think this one, if I remember from start to finish, uh, was about was about 16 months. Yeah. Um, but it was super fun. And, and, you know, all of that, you know, the reporting part is so fun, too, because it's a little bit like a it's a a, a, a squirrel looking for nuts. You know, I mean, it's like this treasure hunt. Right. I mean, it's like, can I find Stu app? And when I find him, is he like available this week for an interview? And right. lo and behold, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, obviously. But uh, and then with the historical pieces too, that's I mean, I'm a I'm a fly fishing geek, always have been. So that stuff was super fun to look up. I went to the Anglers Club of New York, which is has this probably one of the better fish, if not the best angling fishing library in the world. And it's actually right across the uh, East River here. Um, and just went over there and just would sit there with a cup of coffee and you know, just dive in and read the old stuff. And it's just fun to start, you start to subconsciously, you're kind of like putting these pieces together a little bit of of the, how the story is going to, going to be shaped and formed. So yeah, the whole thing is, the whole thing is so fun. I would think it would have been kind of easy to, to just start right there in home assassin, spend the whole, spend the whole book just on those characters and that whole deal kind of like a Carl yep. Hyacin book like I, I yeah. noticed he was one of the people that that had reviewed your book really well mm-hmm. and uh I've read a bunch of his books and and they're just like I mean that's it like that little world in Home Assassin this little tiny town that most people have never heard of and then this just crazy stuff going on there that yeah. nobody could make up I mean seriously yep. like I guess Hyacin does somehow but some have some of it's got to be based on real life because yep. you know like they say truth is stranger than fiction. I mean you could you could definitely do a whole book on on that. I I thought it was interesting to I wanted to show how we got to that point, right? Yeah. How you got yeah. to this the sort of what what could be considered the apex of fly fishing. I don't think we'll ever see a scene like that again. People don't care quite as much about records and all that kind of stuff and it's you know there's all sorts there's carp fishermen and there's trout fishermen and there's striper you know it's like everyone's kind of doing their own thing. But this at that point I mean What's interesting is you look back on these things and, you, and like this, this little era got so much attention, you know, it got like really mainstream attention. It was an ABC TV special about right. it, you know, 3M, you know, financed this huge movie about it. Sports Illustrator wrote this incredible, uh, you know, I think it was a six or seven page feature about it. Uh, New York Times had a story about it. The Associated Press ran. I mean, it was like, it actually was kind of a, you know, we forget all this stuff, right? But it was kind of a big deal. So it was, it was to me, it was huge. interesting to, and to, then to there's sort of oh, sorry right what when well just just to finish this thought just the just to write about kind of what led to that moment and then kind of what came out of that moment to me was was pretty interesting yeah and then not to mention all the all the equipment um evolutions that went yep. on you know supercharged by that that movement yep. and then you know all those guys are kind of or a lot of them are coming back to the keys and then you know just just fishing there and practicing and getting ready for mm-hmm. what what is like the super bowl and yeah, I, right. you know, when I first started in Key West, I heard about all this and, and I would hear all of these stories about Homo Sassa. And I, honestly, I was scared of it. I was scared of the keys. Like I was <laughs> like, I don't need to go up there with those guys. Like that's, right. that's where, that's the big leagues. Um, but that's, that's cool, man. I like what you said about the process of writing that book about, you have to be like a super extrovert to be able to develop the trust from these people. Like a lot of these stories that you're telling in this book are not necessarily stories that people are going to be real open to telling you about. So right. how did that go? Did everybody kind of, uh, cooperate in this or, or yeah. did you, I mean, there's did like, you have to I, like there, twist the arm a little bit? No, I mean, you, you have to be dogged sometimes to get people to, to sit down with you. And, and then, you know, during the process, I mean, I, I was very lucky to be trained at Forbes about how to, you know, a had a fact check, which was good to like make sure that you got your facts right. But B had an interview, you know, and that's like a it is it's a, its own art, and I'm still learning how to do it. I mean, you learn all the time how to do these things, but um, yeah, I mean, you just I don't know, you know, I've generally found. I mean, the Nick Saban book I did, there were a lot of people who didn't really want to talk, who I had to coax into it, 
Um, and I generally find that people actually want to tell stories. Stories are sort of what makes this world go around, right? So if you are dogged enough and patient enough and willing to listen, and if you can ask a good question here and there that kind of brings it out, I mean, you do this with your podcast, right? I mean, that's that's kind of what it's what it's all about. And you know, there were a couple people, <laughs> unlike the Nick Saban book, there only two or three people went didn't want their names in it, and they only because uh, there's a chapter in there about a gangster. Right. And uh, who is now deceased, but they're still scared of uh, the gangster's family who might be around. So they didn't want to say they they said, hey, you can quote me saying something not very nice about this gangster, but please don't put my name in it. So, you know, you you prefer as a writer, not you, you want to have everybody say something on the record. That's what you would prefer. But every once in a while, a quote is good enough or, you know, a source is good enough that you and, and you want to protect them or whatever, respect their wishes anyway. So you'll you know, you'll take their name out. But, yeah. Um, and that was super a, fun. That was a wild twist in the whole, yeah. in the whole story. <laughs> one, one, like it seems like right out of a Carl Hyacinth novel. Like, totally. I mean, all of a sudden you just, everything's going okay. And yeah. then here comes this gangster into the picture and, and just like, just throws a wrench in everything. And, I mean, he was, what a character, huh? Yeah. And, and uh, then how his influence further influenced the whole fly fishing world to the point of, you know, um, you know, I don't want to spoil the book for anybody, but like, like flip pallet becomes kind of involved in that. And it, which leads to kind of, a, a you know, eventually his television show. And yep. it's really just, a, just a wild, wild, wild story. Um, so the way that you did this about going back to the history, I really, really liked. And then how you also told the history and then kind of projected into the future about kind of, and I see you're wearing the captains for clean water hat. Mm -hmm. That was that kind of, um, did you just kind of learn about, I mean, that that's the big question, right? Like what happened to these fish in home Assassa? Like why yep. was it so good? And then it just disappeared. And yep. One of the things that you were talking about in the book that I hadn't really heard, uh, I mean, there's tons of theories and everything, but the theory about how how there used to be so many crabs there and like you you just, I mean, I guess it was probably Steve Huff that was, was explaining it. Like they would be all over your trim tabs. You just look down and there were so many that they were like craw crawling on the trim mm -hmm. tabs. That's a lot of blue crabs. I mean, mm -hmm. and grabbing your push pole and, and like, that's a lot of blue crabs. And then, you know, kind of alluded to the fact that maybe the water quality contributed to the lack of blue crabs and the lack of blue crabs maybe makes those fish just go somewhere else or yep. not exist anymore. Or what, what did you learn about that whole kind of situation in, in writing so this book? I think you can't, you can't really tell the story of Homo Sasa without talking about its downfall as well. I mean, there was a downfall, of course, for the people who were there. These obsessions led to, you know, horrible vices and broken marriages and, and some with a couple of people it led to their, to their death sort of indirectly, I guess. But um, you, you, the, probably the most hard, the hardest hit thing was the fishery itself. And so what, what was interesting about Homo Sasa is it's, the theory is anyway, that this was a particular subgroup of tarpon that, that came to Homo Sasa every May, usually. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, they came to Homo Sasa. Now, part of the theory is that there were so many blue crabs there that, that they could just feast. And that's one of the reasons why they got so big or whatever. So, you know, the crowds that showed up there chasing the world record didn't help. Tarpon don't really like crowds. Um, but as we see in the Keys, you know, they can coexist. They just don't bite as well, but they, they'll, they can coexist with crowds some, somewhere. So it's a big question. And, you know, Tom Evans, who, who uh, is this fantastic character, one of the funniest people I've ever hung out with, just a you know, fascinating guy, is kind of like the, the thread through the whole book. And, yeah. you know, he, he started going there in 1976, uh, and he's 83 years old. He, I was with him last year in 2019. He can't walk. He's, you know, uh, overweight because he can't, his back's so messed up. He can't walk or anything. Like, he can basically stand up for about two minutes. Mm -hmm. And yet he's still there trying to catch a world record. So, you know, he, he talked a lot about why aren't these fish here anymore? And so I figured it was worth looking into, you know, what could be some possible reasons. And so the crowds were obviously one reason, but there, there had to be something different. 
And I think what's different um, is the they had these four big and a ton of springs. It's on the Florida Springs coast is where Home Sass is. So a ton of springs uh, emptied fresh water into Home Sass Bay, but they had partic- in particular four major rivers. And the the aquifer that feeds those rivers, in other words, feeds those springs that go to the river, has been has been depleted. And, uh, you know, a lot of people will say the official sort of Florida state government position is that, oh, it's because we've had a lot of drought. Um, they don't like to mention the fact that they've kind of let anyone take water without any, you know, ramifications or with any regulation at all forever. And so the aquifer keeps going down. Thus, there's less, uh, you know, fresh water in the Sassa Bay. Thus, there are fewer crabs. Not only that, the water quality has also gone down a lot, too. So, you know, I figured it was you, you can't talk about fisheries these days anyway, I feel like without talking about uh, the environment. Right. Um, and I've done a lot of stories. I did actually story in Garden and Gun is where I got this hat about the Everglades and the, you know, the um, the the fight there to try to get that water from Lake Okeechobee to, to, to keep going down to the Everglades, to keep that fresh water going into Florida Bay and uh, to the western part of the Everglades. So. You know, I, I, it, it's a disservice to not talk about these things or to talk about these things without talking about the environment and what what's going on. I mean, this is we we love to fish. Um, and so, you know, we, we I, I what I love about fishermen is that they are very involved in, in saving their own resource. I mean, it might be a little self-serving because they want to catch the fish, but it's, you know, unlike a lot of other people, they actually put the money where their mouths are. Right. And so, um, you know, I think it's I think it's really important to try to you know, at least try to figure out what's going wrong so that we can identify it and hopefully change it yeah. and hopefully get some more water going in and, you know, get the Everglades full of fresh water again. Yeah. Well, the captains for clean water guys are certainly doing a really good job of educating the public and, and getting people involved. And it's been a, been a really good movement. I think that is going to make a big difference. Um, the way that you kind of brought that in and then also kind of talked about, you know, this, the, the, the subject that a lot of people sometimes don't want to talk about is like, okay, so you're fishing for world record tarp. And first of all, there was a, there was the, the part about killing the fish and whether you should kill the fish or not kill the fish. And then, you know, are, are, are we contributing to the problem just by simply by fishing for, for these fish? And, uh, it was, that was a very interesting chapter and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a subject that, it's, it's tough. Like, and, and it was interesting how you, you used quotes from different guides and, and, uh, kind of their opinion of it. Like, are, mm-hmm. are we just contributing to it? Should we be doing this? I don't know. And then there's a quote from Aldo Leopold of like, we protect what we love. And yep. so, I mean, that's kind of where I stand on it is like, if we weren't fishing for these fish and, and even obscure fish or fish that were obscure, like a permit not too long ago, um, who would care whether or not they were around, who would care right. whether or not, um, you know, if it, they're, they're often a, a, a harbinger, like they're often the, the, the canary in the coal mine of yep. if these fish disappear, is there some larger thing that's going to really cause a big problem later? So I don't know, was that, was that delicate talking to, to a lot of people about, about that or people were pretty open about that or. It's a, to me, it's a delicate subject that, that even I grapple with all the time. I mean, is it, you know, you're, it's something that everyone, every angler has to come to their own terms with and his or her, his or her own terms with, you know, because the, even the act of catching and releasing is not good for the fish. It just isn't, you know, I mean, whether it causes them pain or not, whatever, but you, as Steve Huff says, he said one time I, I caught a tarp and he let it go. And he said, oh, you wrecked that guy's day. You know, and like, <laughs> it's true. You know, it's funny, but it is, it is kind of true. So the, you know, it, this was, that chapter is kind of about like what, you know, the morality of fishing. And, um, and so, you know, it, to hear different guides say Dustin Huff uh, was, was very good on it. And, uh, you know, John O'Hearn was great on it. I mean, you know, I, I, we kill a lot of fish, whether we're catching release anglers or not, we just do. It's a blood sport still. You, you, release fish, they get eaten by sharks, they die of exhaustion or whatever. We just do that. That's something we have to come to terms with. If we're not comfortable with that, then you probably, you know, shouldn't fish with a hook or shouldn't fish at all or whatever. But in the end, you know, I'm like you, I mean, there's, there's the good done by BTT, by, uh, you know, 
um, Caps for Clean Water, by the Atlantic Salmon Federation, by Trout Unlimited. These are all angler groups. These are all people who are interested in, who, who love to fish. And the good done by those groups, this also extends to hunting too, by the way, Ducks Unlimited, uh, far outweighs the bad. Uh, I remember reading a story one time when I lived in Washington, D.C., there was a, a little river in Maryland and PETA was out there. Some members of PETA were out there throwing rocks while the fishermen were trying to fish this one run. And I literally wanted to be like, you know what? If those fishermen weren't there, there would be no fish in here for you to, to, to be throwing rocks about. I mean, what, you know, what, it's just a, it's a, uh, it's a, I don't know, it's annoying, first of all, but it's also like there's a disconnect a little bit about how people view these things. And yes, it may be self serving that we anglers want to conserve these fish so we can angle for them. But if we're not doing it, who else is? It's right. Not well, like, no one. And it's certainly not going to be PETA because right. I can probably, I mean, I can't say this with any factual, uh, I don't know if any PETA people are giving money to, to, you know, make sure that we have fish and wildlife officers out there or, or, you know, that the, that the laws are being, um, enforced or anything like that. But I do know that every time you buy a fishing license or a hunting license, that a certain percentage of that goes towards that as well as other conservation um, efforts. And we have a self-imposed tax on all of our fishing and hunting equipment, which yep. I don't think that PETA is doing that. I don't think that that anyone, you know, that is complaining about, you know, animal rights or whatever is doing it with their wallet like hunters yep. and fishermen. I mean, even, right. even to the point of like backpackers and people like that, they're not doing that. And, you know, I like doing those things too, but when it comes to real, um, financial, you know, I mean, take, take somebody like the nature conservancy, like, okay, we don't even want to, we don't even want to mess with, uh, rules and regulations. We're just going to buy this and preserve it and take care mm -hmm. of it ourselves. Like mm -hmm. there's not even any reason to, to have all this, you know, squabbling and back and forth. Let's just raise the money, buy it and take care of it. And, yep. you know, they can do whatever they want to it at that point. But, uh, or, you know, I don't know, so many people that are doing it with financial um, things rather than just complaining. It doesn't do yep. anything. I mean, it's hard to, you know, it's hard for people to, it's hard for a kid in Queens to care about an Atlantic salmon or a tarpon, right? Right. But do if you, you eat them? If you, I don't care. If you, if you fish for those things, if you, you know, engage and, and if you, 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 there's a communication that goes on between an angler and a, and the, and the prey of predator and prey a little bit, you know, that, that is sort of, it's hard to explain. It's like ineffable. It's an old like trait in our, you know, from the beginning of humanity really. And if you don't have that communication, you don't care, you know? So yeah. I, it's, it's very cool to me that, that anglers, I mean, it's the, it, it is, if you ever are, you know, wavering about the morality of fishing and, and hunting, I mean, I think that's one thing you can kind of come back to that, you know, you just by, just by doing it, even whether or not you're a member, you should be a member of BTT and Captain for Clean Water. But if you're not, even that, if you bought a license, if you bought some gear, you're helping out. Yeah. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a very interesting part of it. I'm glad you brought that into it, both both the the history and the the projecting forward and kind of thinking about those things. Cause they I mean it made your book more interesting for sure. Um, it was already funny. But uh <laughs> some of the funniest things that I that I read in your book were some of the stories of the early, early players in Key West. And um how was it trying to uncover those? Because some of those people are gone. Uh, Jim yep. Harrison, Russell Chatham, yep. uh, mm -hmm. that band of characters. Um, and, and there were some remnants of that when I, I used to fish with Dan Gerber, who's a writer yep. and kind of a, he was kind of part of that group a little bit and, and he wasn't anywhere nearly as wild as those guys, but <laughs> he would tell us a lot of stories about, you know, that, that group of merry pranksters and, yep. uh, how, how did you kind of, who, who did you go to, to get those stories? How did you get those stories? So, uh, Guy, Guy Valdine was, was one of those yeah. guys, uh, Russell, I happened to interview before he passed away. Oh. Uh, he passed away in November. I think I interviewed him in August or July of the year he passed away. And then I actually, uh, went out to Montana to hang out with McGuane and got a lot of good stories from him as well. So, uh, it was, that was an incredible era there. I mean, it was the, the artists, you know, it was like McGuane, the writer and Guy Valdine's a writer as well. And Russell, Chatham was a painter and, and, uh, Harrison of course was a writer and they were all kind of young and, and, and 
early enough in their careers, but they were all just obsessed with, I mean, something about tarpon just got them. I mean, they weren't down there bone fishing or permit fishing. They were there for the tarpon to the point where they even made the, the movie, which I'm sure you've seen yeah. tarpon. Um, well, I got, I was it, one of the people that got to see that with, when it was passed around on the VHS yeah, tape that you were I, talking about, because yeah, Dan Gerber yeah, yeah. had a copy and he would bring it and he would sit us all down and he's like, here, check this out. And then they had a copy in the saltwater angler that you could watch. And, and it was yeah. an amazing movie. It's like, so so cool. Yeah. I mean, what he tried and, to do, if you haven't seen that movie, he um, tried to make this big comparison between this, this, you know, tarpon fishing, catch and release tarpon fishing out of a little boat and just doing it with a fly. And then, then um, kind of comparing that and contrasting it to the, what was going on in the charter boats, these garbage cans full of these sharks and fish and it was death. And, you know, and, and then, then he would take you back out to the flats with these guys and they were barely fishing outside of Key West and their fish were everywhere. And it was just an amazing movie, the way that they, the way he pulled that all together. And, and what an era. I mean, there was like, you know, they weren't doing really hardcore drugs at that point. They were, you know, smoking a little marijuana, and they, but they were, you know, they, they, I, Russell Chatham said something to the effect, like, you know, I can't believe we got away with this. Like it was just <laughs> so fun. I mean, they, they, they literally, they didn't miss a good, they never missed a good fishing day. They always, were they were fishermen first and they would be out there fishing but then they would come back and you know the party either started at their house they rented or they're in the chart room which i'm not sure if that's there anymore but i didn't um, i didn't know that place that was one where i was trying to figure out where that would be yeah it was in a hotel and, yeah it was in a hotel yeah and so you know they just they just had and i mean it just sounded like it sounded like 20 year old you know in your 20s sound like heaven right i mean you fished all day and you went out and had fun with your buddies every night like a lot of fun but then of course that kind of crashed too that got a little you know got a little squirrely towards the end but uh that era you know just qs has always kind of been attracted artists and people who don't necessarily fit in the continental u.s and fishermen of course and you know it's just it's just so cool key west it maybe is a little less like that these days but but probably has remnants of it you would you know you would probably you and that no i think i think key west is one of those places that that will always draw artists and you you mentioned it many times in your book the history of that too like of ernest hemingway and and tennessee williams and on and on and on uh, all these people that spent time there so many people that i i didn't even know had spent time in Key West. I'd learned from your book and was like, and then you put it all together. How, you know, Ernest Hemingway just punches, uh, who was it that he punched after that party? It was, uh, uh, the the poet, uh, the poet. That was a great Uh, story. I'd never heard that story before. I mean, you hear all these stories about (laughs) Ernest Hemingway. It's rare that you find one that you've never heard before. And then when it all ties in with the whole fishing world, I I couldn't put your book down. I I just, I mean, I, I don't read digital books very often because I, yeah. I kind of lose interest in them. But like my wife left and I was sitting just like this reading on my computer and she came back like an hour and a half later and she goes, you're still there. And I was like, I, I can't stop reading this book. Like there were That's just awesome. so many of these awesome stories. I mean, it just fits squarely in my world. So I just, I just loved it. But you don't, you don't know how happy it makes a writer to hear that. If you just reach one person, that's all you, you know, well, you want to gonna, hear one person have a good experience. That's all, you know, you're going to reach all you, way all more than open. one person. I mean, they're not like the fly fishing world is, is, is huge or anything, but anybody that knows this world, anybody that spent time in home Sassa, anybody that spent time in the keys, anybody that, that, I mean, if you know that world, it's already a kind of a quirky, weird world anyway, even today. Yep. And then to, to hear, you know, the history of where it came from and, 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 you know, how these guys were doing some really incredible things, like going back to Stu Apt and, and, and those guys catching world records on bamboo rods and, making, making lines out of 200 pound tests so they could fish around the bridges. I yep. mean, man, that's where you're just like, wow, this sport's come a long way and it's really cool that you can just walk in and buy stuff. And these guys were like, they were sanding down 200 pound tests so that they could have a fly line to throw. And, 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 you know, the heaviest rod that anybody made was an eight weight. Like uh-huh. that's all, it's super cool because it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't. And we take, you know, I don't know about you, but I take it for granted. You know, I've 
got a hardy rod and I've got a great Tibor reel. And I'm like, this is the way it's always been, yeah. but that's not the case. And it wasn't that long ago when it wasn't like that, no, you know, and I it's, mean, like, it's because of these guys and the innovations they help put forward, you know, the flip pallets and the Chico's and, you know, on up to the Evans and the Billy Pates that helped us get to this point, right. you know, where, where it, it is incredible. It's kind of, kind of interesting too, I, I guess, because the sport is, is young enough to where a lot of these people that you wrote about are still alive. Um, we lost Lefty just a little while ago, but so many of these people that made these big innovations in tackle, so many of these people that made these big contributions in world records and setting the bar so high are still around. And then mm -hmm. you can trace it back to, wow, this didn't really happen that long ago. It's not like yeah. baseball or football right. to where like there's so it's so long ago that it's lifetimes ago. Like this is all happening in you know, a certain lifetime. And then these people are still around and you could still go talk to them. In a lot of cases, mm -hmm. you're reading their books or watching them on TV or, or whatever. And then you're kind of learning the backstory, like about Flip Pallet and, uh, and Chico Fernandez meeting in a bait yep. shop when they were, when they were mm -hmm. kids and, and then having this lifelong friendship. That's really, really cool. I, I, I enjoyed that part really a lot. Yeah. Good. Um, so the, uh, the the one thread that runs through the whole book is Tom Evans. Yep. And Tom Evans would be the one person that somebody that is new to the sport or, I mean, even somebody that spent a lot of time in the sport might not know. And right. it was kind of interesting how you almost painted that as like, that was on purpose. Like he didn't, he, like you had... You had um, Flip Pallet and Chico Fernandez and Lefty Cray and Stu Apt kind of moving towards, a, you know, like we're going to make a career out of this where Tom Evans was just like, it was, it was cool too because of his background as a wrestler and a nose guard and mm -hmm. a super competitive guy that he just wanted the biggest fish on fly that you could possibly get. And he's a, he's a very interesting character like that. Um, and then the way that this whole thing went down with, with, with Steve Huff landing mm -hmm. a, a tarpon, a 186, that was right. 186, right? Yep, 186, yeah. yep. And then these guys being teammates and your chief competitor for years, mm -hmm. that is wild. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Their relationship, I mean, I just, I mean, Tom Evans and Steve Huff to me are the sort of, they sort of parallel throughout the book, right? I mean, Tom is, Tom is the thread. He's the, he's, I start with Tom and I end with Tom. Um, and by the way, that last chapter is my favorite chapter in the, in fact, I think the last little line is my favorite line of the entire book. Not that anyone should skip ahead, but, um, and then you got Steve Huff, who's kind of like the, you know, the moral center of the book, right? I mean, he's, he's there, he's always he's doing the right thing. He was there for the, for the heyday, he left in disgust, you know, because it got too popular. He's, he's still out there. Uh, and then their stories kind of come together at the end as well. But, you know, Tom, Tom's, you know, T Tom, one of the reasons that Tom didn't chase fishing fame is because he, he made a lot of money right. You know, he was a stockbroker in, in New York. So he didn't really need fame to, for, to make a living, I guess. Um, but he also, you know, he had a little, he's a cantankerous guy. So he's not like the most, you know, some, not the most likable fella to some people. Sometimes he kind of says he's very blunt. Um, he says whatever the hell he wants to say, you know, like I, I think I described him in the book as a, as a bull, very happy to find himself in a China <laughs> shop. You know, I mean, he's like, he likes to stir things up a little bit. Um, but his dedication to me, he, he was the reason he was meeting Tom and hearing his story was the, was when I realized, okay, I can, I can do this. Like I can pull this book off because this guy, you know, first fished there in his early thirties or in his thirties and now he's 83 and he can't walk and he can't really stand. And he basically is for all intents and purposes, a shut in, right. Who just sits in his house in Vermont. Um, and yet he comes down every year still for a month to fish, to try to break this world record. And I was like, okay, if people are that obsessed, like I mean, I'm all in. Um, so yeah, but it's, it, it is also to me, it was interesting. Like it would have been really fun to, if the pallet was the main character, I still think it would have worked. If Billy Pate was the main character, it still would have worked, but to find someone or to have someone brought to me really by Andy and Steve Huff, uh, who, who was not that well known. Like I knew the name, right. But I didn't really know much about him. 
uh, to me, was a really interesting way to to look at this whole thing, not through one of the eyes of the superstars, uh, you know, the lefty craze or whatever that we all know, but through someone that we we don't know all that well. So there's a little bit more area to kind of discover who he is. Um, it's very it makes a good kind of compare and contrast when you talk about other anglers and, you know, and, you know, most importantly, he was there 41 out of 43 years. I, I think I calculated that he spent three and a half years of his life in Homo Sassa on a boat, bobbing up and down, looking for the world record tarpon. And how many I mean, of those, just, and how many of those years was, was he looking at nothing? Empty water is what I mean. So he kept a log. So the, another the great thing about Tom is that he kept this log book, which he still had. And so, I went down to Homo Sassa two years and spent two weeks with, with Tom and his guide, Al DePiric, and uh, another uh, kind of his, his gaffer and first mate who was there was this guy named Dean Butler, his Aussie. Another a crazy great, character to add a, to the mix. An incredible. I mean, it was, and it was so fun. I mean, it was like just the on the water stuff was fun too, but like coming off the water, listening to these guys tell stories, and it was just so, so damn fun. But, uh, you know, so Tom. Tom, he has this great, he has a great memory, which is, which is awesome, but he also has to back it up. He's got these log books. So he, he just said, here, I said, what are these? He said, these are log books. Uh, every year when I was down here, I took, you know, every day I'd write down what happened. I was like, are you kidding me? So I like, you know, spent a month just looking through the log books and kind of, you know, uh, checking out stuff. And there were years when he went in the nineties in particular, when the fishery just fell off the cliff when he didn't catch a fish. He would be there the whole month and they would go out, maybe not every day, but they'd, cause they'd be rain or some, some days, but they go out 28, 27 days of the 30 days and would not catch a fish would maybe cast to one or two. I mean, there was a couple of times I got a little bit lucky when I went there because I went there for two years and I, I had actually decent fishing when I was there, but there were some days when you sat out there, I did experience a little bit of the tough home assess. So when you sat out there and, and you didn't see a fish, I mean, you did not see one fish and it's, you're just standing there in the hot sun being like, wow, you know, I mean, the dedication that all of these guys, but in particular, Tom, who really kept at it after the fishery fell off the cliff, it's just, it's mind boggling. It's really, it's so interesting to me that someone would keep doing this, that it means that much to them. Dedication. I mean, to a fault. I mean, that's, that's so much of, of the, 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 kind of the thread that runs through this is like this, it became so obsessive. It even says in your title, man madness obsession and the hunt for the world record tarpon like it almost drove people insane yeah and yep. and then the dedication to this was just i don't know that there's anything like it honestly i mean do, have, when when you're researching all of this i mean did you did you come across other or, i mean i guess well the the largemouth bass i mean there's certainly people that have devoted their entire life yeah. to to that and you know, Billy Pate did a, did a lot, you know, outside of tarpon fishing, he was looking for, for billfish records as well. But, mm -hmm. um, man, I don't know. You didn't miss it. You didn't miss a single story. Like as soon as I was started reading about, um, Billy Pate and then I, I read this story about Brian O'Keefe and like, I remember that kind of happening and Brian going, I don't know. He's so pissed. Like, <laughs> I mean, so that's a great example of a story. So I, 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 I knew that, you know, cause there's a Brian O'Keefe who, uh, I worked at sports Field way back in the day when I first moved to New York was my first uh, magazine job. And, you know, he was one of the, he was one of the photographers for sports Field. So I, I, you know, I didn't know him, but every once in a while I had to email him and say, Hey, Brian, we need a, do you have a photo of a Dorado or whatever? Right? Mm -hmm. And so, well, I remember looking at the IGFA book and seeing on the 20 pound class, seeing Brian O'Keefe. I was like, Wow, the <laughs> photographer guy from the Northwest. I was like, that's really interesting. So then I, you know, I, I called him, and then I got this incredible story, you know. And then I called <laughs> there was another guy, Tom Gibson, who was a Houston tarpon guy, who was on the trip as well. So it's a great example of like, there's just a little hint of something right here. Make a phone call or two and see like what's going on. And then all of a sudden, this huge, interesting, weird story blossoms out of that little <laughs> tiny, little tiny thing. I mean, it's just it's fascinating. It's such it's so indicative. I think of like the competitiveness and Billy paid to drive and, you know, just the whole craziness of the, of the tarpon world record chase that people would go to Africa and like in the middle of a civil war when there was a, you know, O'Keefe had this great anecdote about when they were, they flew into, they flew into uh, the, the place and they got there and uh, went out in a boat to their, they were being taken out in like a little whaler out to their mothership and they went by and they realized they were in the middle of the civil war and there was a, 
a post like this with a severed human head <laughs> on top of it. And, wow. and he was like, well, this is going to be an interesting fishing trip. I mean, you don't really see that when you go fish on the, on the batten kill, you know what I'm saying? <sighs> so it, you know, it was just like, I just love I mean, to, just those little bits of when I was talking about the squirrel and the nut, right. That that's a big nut. That was a fun one, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you dove in, you called, sometimes you call these things and, and nothing happens. Like, it's just like, oh, didn't, you know, there was nothing that's not even worth reporting but every once in a while you get something like this and you just hit gold and it feels it's just awesome it's just so fun so how many times do you think that people are like ah it's nothing you don't, you don't even want to talk about it and 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 there really was something there but they're not they're not telling you because like when you, you undercover use, these stories like this it's like eh, is there something there because it seems like there could you know, be <laughs> i'm sure that i'm sure i missed some stories but uh you know like i said before i think people like to tell stories right so if you just Ask them, like, is there anything there? You know, you ask a couple questions and then if you hear like a little pause or something, there's a change in the air, there's a pause, something like that. And then you're like, hmm, okay. Tell me a little bit more about that. You know, like, it is just, I don't know, it's so fun. And I'm sure there are times too when there are no stories, right? So, but then what's interesting too is like for a lot, for these stories, you got to, you got to make sure they're true, you know? Yeah. So (laughs) how do you do that? I mean. Well, you, you, you try to get the old rule at Forbes was you needed three sources for every fact. Um, which is I try to maintain that uh, thing. But for the Billy Pate, uh, uh, Sierra Leone story, um, Billy's not around anymore. So I asked an ex-wife, I got Brian O'Keefe, I got Tom Gibson, and I got Pierre Afray. All to sort of, you know, I would, you know, heard this, heard their versions of this, or heard all of the story from them, basically. And they all kind of meshed into one narrative that, that checked out. So, you know, you just got to call, you got to just make another phone call, make another phone call, but that's, it's all fun. You get more, I got more nuggets. I, when I was interviewing Pierre Frey, he told me the story, but putting the hook in his, his uh, <laughs> nether regions, you know I mean? See, it's like, there's a, little things from, there's from another yeah. story that I, that I had heard. I mean, you always heard this, like, be careful, man. Somebody stuck a, stuck a tarp and fly through his, through his dick one time. And you're like, <laughs> you know, you hear this story, just like somebody pooping in the live well, you know, a lady pooping right. in the live well. And you hear this story right. over and over and over again. And then your book like brings it all around. It's like, no, that really happened. And this is the yeah. guy it happened to. And he was fishing in a speedo and like, <laughs> it just, he just, just, he just got over, he got, he got tarpon fever, got overexcited. He was great too, because he also told me a story. He said, Pierre Afray, who's a French Frenchman who loves fishing. He's on the board, I think of the IGFA. I mean, he's a, he's a big time fishing guy, but he told me that he hooked a fish, a tarpon in Homosassa that, that was, and I've always wondered if this happened too, that was, he was fighting, he was fighting it. And there was, there was Bill Curtis was nearby. And then the fish jumped like that and it jumped over Bill Curtis's boat. <laughs> he told me that story. Like I can't, I can't, I couldn't fact check that with Bill Curtis, but it was, that was good enough to put it in there and said, Pierre Afray claims that, you know, da, 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 da. So, uh, but yeah, it's these, these, the other one in there that I always had wondered about too, I always heard about uh, guides who tried to tie flies out of pubic hair, right? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, whatever, that's probably a urban myth or whatever. But then I found a guy who didn't, he's another guy who didn't want to go on record. I found a guy who had done that, actually done it a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> it was really interesting to, to actually be like, because I was like, what do you name it? Does it work? Like, why did you do it? You know, there's lots of questions that come up with you when you hear about these things. But you're right. I mean, these, I've heard the lady pooping in the live well story probably 50 times. Yeah. You know, I just, I'm sure it's happened. So yeah. and it pro- you probably heard it that it happened in Homosassa. And then I probably heard it that it happened in Key West. And I heard you know, the Everglades, actually. So, heard okay. It, yeah. So it probably happened. Who knows where it happened and whose right. boat it happened to. But um, it's a hilarious story where, the guy. <laughs> but I don't know if it happened. I mean, it must have happened. It had to have I'm happened sure for yeah, for that story sure to to go around, just like all of these others. And you're like, oh, it did happen. Like, you know, <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. There's so it. many. There's so many funny stories. So at some point, some of these stories, when you're fact checking them, have to get a little uncomfortable. Like if you're talking mm-hmm. to Billy Pate's ex wife about this period in his life where he mounted this giant expedition to Africa to go mm-hmm. catch a world record tarpon and brings along the best photographer he can find, Brian O'Keefe, who then mm-hmm. sets the world record right out from under him. Right. He was with a Billy Pate reel, by the way, triple pissed. Right. And so that had to be a very uncomfortable time for the ex-wife. So you're, you're asking 
about this story. I'm sure there's tons of these other stories where in order to fact check them, you've got to kind of navigate through some pretty tricky and uncomfortable waters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Any stories like that? Uh, you know, let me think. I mean, there's not really, I mean, I've, you know, I've been, because I was at Forbes at Forbes when I, when I was there, there there's no digital component. It wasn't Forbes.com. It was just a magazine, right? And it it prided itself on being, you know, it might not have been the most readable magazine, but the facts were right. Right. It was like, we had this, you actually started there as a, I started there as a fact checker. I was a reporter, but what you really did is some big shot came in with some big feature story on the, on the CEO of Coca-Cola. And like, I had to fact check it. And like, we had this crazy, thing where you highlighted some things and you, you never really checked quotes, but you checked the, the substance of quotes and all this kind of stuff. So I was really well-versed. I did two years of that pretty intensive. So I was pretty well-versed in like how to ask the question and not that, not let them wiggle out of the truth. Right. Cause some, a lot of people here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing a Harvard business school case right now, which is I'm writing one, which is really interesting. It's not journalism because you actually send the quotes to the people and they have to sign off on them. And so what, what that, what that allows people to be, to do is like, oh, I didn't really say that. And they rewrite, they rewrite the quote or whatever. Right. So that's, that's not really a fair thing to do either, really. So there's the way to, you know, get the substance of these things across, um, and the facts and then, and just make sure they're, make sure they're correct. Right. I mean, and you don't want to be sued for libel or anything like that, but I didn't get, you know, I, 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 I didn't get a whole lot of pushback, uh, from people. I, I, I generally think people were just, they just were excited to tell, the stories. I mean, you know, this is for a lot of people. I mean, this is, you know, this is Stu App's life. This is Sandy Moretz. This is what animates them. It's what's driven them. It's what they've loved all their life. They were so happy to talk about uh, these things. And, and, you know, so I think that makes it a little bit easier too. When you're, when you're talking about something that someone loves, yeah, like they'll tell you a lot of good stuff. About and it was it, the know? heyday. Plus, you know, fishermen, tend to like you sit at the Lorelei, you're going to hear some stories whether you want to or not. Right. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to, you're going to hear stories. People like to have a couple of beers and start talking about how it was in the old days. Yep. And, but it's, it's a different kind of thing when, when you're like, well, I wonder if that really happened. So now yeah. I'm going to have to go ask fun, this other guy. Yeah. Which is a fun thing. I mean, that's how you get to the bottom of the Brian O'Keefe story. That's how you, that's how you find the Pierre F. Ray story. That's how you find, you know, the pubic care guide story. I mean, it's like, it was, it's kind of fun. Like I was like, just do these things exist? Let's dive in. I mean, there are other things I looked at that didn't, I couldn't corroborate or whatever. So I didn't put them in there, but you know, it's just fun to, and you know, as you said, you let off with, with saying that you were familiar with so many stories, but didn't know the details to me. That, that to me is what, it, is what my job is as a, as a book author. I did that with Nick, with the Nick Saban book too. I mean, there's people knew that he was the head coach at Michigan state uh, for a little while. But what was that era like, right? So it was my job to go in there and talk to the people who were there, talk to the players, talk to the administrators, talk to assistant coaches, and like tell you stories from that era that you so you knew about that. So you, it's actually a really good thing because the reader has a little bit of a connection, and then you're drawing them in even more by supplying the details. Um, and I like that too. Like I, li- I'm familiar with these stories a little bit, and it's so fun to go dive in and like get the get the real stories and get the you know get people talking about them. And, pull out the, the little interesting details that make these stories sing. And, you know, I mean, that's sort of, I feel like that's my job as an author to do that. Yeah. What kind of time did you spend with Nick Saban? So I spent, um, I wrote a cover story for him about him, uh, for Forbes, I think in his coming into his second year at Alabama. And I don't know if you remember, but his first year was at least by his standards was kind of a disaster. They were finished six and five. They lost to Louisiana Monroe. I mean, it was like, so here was a guy who like had been paid all this money and he was supposed to be the savior of this program, which used to be one of the best in the nation it had fallen on terrible hard times that had been under, you know, inve- SEC uh, investigations and punishments. And he was the guy who was trying to like, you know, get it back on its footing. And basically what the university had done has been like, you know, here are the keys, man. Like it's all yours. Like, so he became this powerful, incredibly powerful person and turned out to be the best decision Alabama ever made, not only for the football team, but for the university itself. And that, in that book, I talk a lot about how just Nick Saban's presence there and the excellence of the football team, how that's elevated the, you know, scholastic part of the university. They have more road scholars than they've ever had before. And they've had more people, you know, applying there from Montana, New York and New Jersey and, you know, Connecticut and California than they've ever had before. Um, so it's, uh, it was, that was really cool. So I spent a lot of time with him for that, 
uh, article. And then I decided to write a book uh, about him. And we spent some time after that. And then he just said, you know, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. And I said, <laughs> fine. And actually, that turned out to be the best thing. Because when you write about someone, you sort of you develop a relationship. So you can kind of your, your objectivity kind of can get clouded a little bit because you start to like the person, right? That's one of the dangers in my profession is that you actually start to like the people you're writing about. So it's sometimes hard to write the difficult things about them. And so, you know, it's not like I'm trash Nick Saban in the book, but I, I wanted to tell the objective story of, of Nick Saban. And so there are some stories in there, uh, anecdotes in there that are not very flattering to him that I may have had second thoughts had he been, you know, still involved in it about running him. And I think this gave me the kind of, you know, lane in which to write the story, a true objective story after interviewing, I think I interviewed 265 people for that book, you know, including Bill Belichick and Saban's golf partner and all, you know, it was like his players and stuff like that. So I feel like I've got this, you know, he, he'll have his own story to tell when he writes his own book, but I feel like this is a really interesting way to look at someone, you know, what everyone else, how everyone else sees him and the stories that they can tell about him, which is something he won't have in his own book. So I think it's a, it's a useful thing. And it was, you know, he's like one of these Tarpon guys. I mean, he's absolutely obsessed with not really the winning, but he's obsessed with the minutiae of the, the he's what he calls the process, right? right. I mean, he's, he's obsessed with, obsessed with the day-to-day -day operations of how to create a winning football program. And, uh, you know, that to me is real. I, I, you know, I learn a lot from a lot of these books too. I learn, I learn things about that I kind of incorporate into my own life. And I think that process thinking is a really good way to get through, especially stressful times like these, right? Where we have a pandemic and we have protests and we, you know, it's like, it's a crazy time, right? So like, if you just kind of take things kind of, don't worry about the, the end goal. Don't worry about the, the, you know, the, whatever, winning the championship or whatever, just worry about things kind of on a day-to-day -day level on a minute to minute level. Right. And I think that just gives you a little bit, you bite off what you can chew and not too much. Right. So anyway, that was, a long answer to a question. No, no. I, I mean, I, I'm fascinated with Nick Saban. I'm a, I went to the university of Alabama and you um, did. yeah. Right. And so did my wife. That's where I met my wife there. And, and, um, so I was, you know, I, I'm probably the worst university of Alabama fan there, there is. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't have a flag outside of my house. I don't, you know, like I shouldn't, I, I'll probably, there's some bad things that could happen to me if people found out that I only watched like two games last year, but you know, you can't, it'd be like being part of this tarpon world and then not like being aware of what's going on. Like that's part of going to Alabama. You become part of that culture. And even if you don't watch the games, you know what it's all about and you can understand where these people are coming from and you can understand these people that are so hardcore. And then you can understand these people that have turned their back on it and you can t understand yep. all of these different perspectives of the whole thing. But Nick Saban is somebody that, that I often look to as just like a motivator. Like he obviously is a, is a world-class motivator to be able to take these unbelievable athletes and have them want to go there and play for right. him when they right. know I'm not going to get on the field for two years. Like I have no, I'm going to be fifth string. I have no chance. I could go to any other school and, and just dominate this year, yep. you know, or I'll at least be playing. And, yep. and yet he continues to get people to do that. That's one of the most interesting things to me is how deep his roster is and how, oh, yeah. you know, like they'll, they'll have a quarterback that's hurt and then they'll play their fifth string quarterback. And he's like the best right. anybody's ever seen. Like what he, is going on here? He was Mr. California as a high school player or something like that. Yeah. No, it's crazy. So what was interesting to me, we, we started off this conversation too, talking about extrovert, extroversion and introversion. Right. I mean, everyone, uh, Nick Saban is kind of a classic introvert. I feel like, like he doesn't like being in big crowds very much, particularly big crowds. He, He's with the media, he's curt and terse and just, you know, will chew somebody out. You know, I mean, they're actually hilarious. Yeah. Press conferences. I love it. Um, uh, and so, but you can't be like that and be the recruiter. He's, he's, he's arguably the best college recruiter of all time. If you just look at the talent he's recruited and the teams he's put together, this goes back to Michigan state, by the way, he was a great recruiter there too. Um, you can't be like a total, you have to be, Charming. And the one thing I found that made that really animated me and got me going when I did that first story at Forbes is how personable he was. 
you know, one-on-one, how charismatic he was, like how much I was like, I remember at one point we were having a lunch in his office and he has the same damn lunch every day. He has like uh, iceberg lettuce and chicken on, you know, with chicken on top. And we're just, you know, shoveled it in. And the call came in, it was a recruiting call. So I had to leave because I'm the reporter guy. And he was like, just come back in like 20 minutes. And I, I remember running out in the parking lot and getting on my phone and calling my buddy, Charlie, he was a big Alabama fan and, and, you know, and I was being like, dude, this is a huge, I mean, this guy's amazing, dude. It's a huge story. Like I'd run through a brick wall for this dude, you know, like if, so there is this, it's just, that to me is a really interesting dynamic that you can do both. You can be kind of both of these people, right? You can just, you could be this, he is one-on-one, which is why he's gotten so many great recruits. Uh, he is just incredible. I mean, he's just not only to the, to the kid, but to the kid's parents, right. you know, and to the, to the, kid's brother and the kid's sister. I mean, he's just, he's just an incredible thing. And I, I always find it. So, you know, I, I grew up in Birmingham for a little while and, um, you know, moved up here. So I live in Brooklyn now and I go out to like the New York suburbs to see friends or whatever. And I run into little like 10 year old boys who, you know, who they know kind of what's going on in sports. Right. And they're wearing an Alabama jersey. I'm like, why are you wearing that Alabama jersey? It's my favorite team. Like, really? You're a kid in like, you know, wherever, Westchester County, New York, and Alabama is your favorite football team. Yeah. So, I mean, that excellence, like, it, it's how far reaching that excellence is, is just really fascinating to me. It's like they're the Yankees at this point, the Yankees of, uh, of college football. It's yeah. incredible. And it's all, it's a due to him. It is, it is incredible. And what's interesting to me, too, is like when they're ahead by, I don't know, an, an insurmountable amount of points. Right. And somebody does something stupid on the field and it has, it's so inconsequential to the, to the outcome of the game. They're going to win by 50 and he is, he, he's furious. He's spitting his face is red and he goes over to that guy and just chews him out. And it's like, why is he getting so mad over, over that? It's, it means nothing, but it doesn't, it means everything It is like you run this play like it's the only play you're going to run all day. And I don't care if we're ahead by 50 or 100 or down by 100. You are going to perform perfectly every time or you'll be somewhere else. And these guys are like snapping too. like, sorry, coach. You know, it's just fascinating that someone because the amount of discipline that you have to have to pay attention to details when you're up by 60 is, I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. That's like yeah, being I mean, that's, in a fishing tournament, you know, and you've, you, you, you've tripled everyone else's score, but yet you're still paying attention. You don't miss a shot. Yep. Like it's, it's hard. It's hard to do. I that. mean, to, to him, I mean, that's how success is bred, right? I mean, it's about the, that's the process. That's his phrase was how you do anything is how you do everything. And which again, like I was saying, how I learn things through these books. Like I say that I have three daughters and I'm sometimes like, girls, how you do anything is how you do everything. And they look at me like, what are you talking about? But I mean, there, you know, there is like, there's, it's a parental, it can be this, it's basically sort of like, it's not the destination, it's the journey, right? I mean, that's kind of what his, if you want to boil his thing down to a cliche, that's kind of what it is, right? It's about, that's what's really important. Um, and so that's really, you know, I don't know, that's fascinating. And, and, you know, just to bring it back to Tarpon, these world record hunters, uh, it, 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 you know, it wasn't really about, it was, in a lot of cases, it wasn't really about the world record. It was about what, what going through the process to try to go for the world record kind of put in place and what the friendships that were formed and the, you know, the kind of funky bonds that take place among friends and foes. And the, you know, I mean, you, you, I think if you talk to Tom Evans, he would look back and say, yeah, it was like, yeah, I only, you know, I went there for 41 years and I caught world records in seven of those years. That's it. But it was worth it. Yeah. You know, it was like, it was the, and, and that, that, you know, gets back to that homeless ass of poon shack as, as Tom called it. Like it was fun. You know, it was actually fun to have dinner every night and sit around. And especially if you're like me and like you, I mean, it's just fun to hear these stories. You know, yeah. you just, you just, you you feel, I felt privileged to be sitting there listening to stories about fishing with Billy Pate and going to dinner with Ted Williams and, you know, about Chico and about flip pallets cast. And I mean, it was just, it's just, I don't know, still makes the hair stand up on my mm-hmm. arm. Sometimes I think about how cool all this stuff is. You yeah. Know? That's a cool period of time. And then, then like what you said, uh, and then comparing it to Alabama is like, you had all these people that are just happy to be there and they're happy to be one of the people that's trying to do this crazy thing. 
But then you've got the Steve Huff, Tom Evans pair that is right. like that. They're not happy with being one of the people that's trying to do this thing. They are going to do this thing or die trying. Right. Like yep. and you have, and that's the big separation. You've got like the Tom Evans, Billy Pate, you know, people that are willing to do whatever it takes to make this happen. And they're not just happy just being part of this, hanging out at the poon shack and listening to the right. stories. Like yep. they, that's the Nick Saban. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the guy that is like, we're here to catch them. We're not here to screw around. And, uh, that's, that's pretty cool, man. It's, yep. it's, it's such a crazy, crazy little, little, um, world. So in your opinion, do you think the, the, world record largemouth bass world or the world record tarpon world is crazier um you know they're very different right i mean the, just the socioeconomics of the two were completely different yeah right i mean the, you in had order almost to go nothing to record, gain with the tarpon well well that and also there's the, the people who go after it are generally you know uh have more economic means um and so that that kind of adds to the mix a little bit too but you know, I, to me, the world record tarpon, although Linville just just did break uh, the six pound not long ago. Um, incredible record, me, by the way. Yeah, that was an incredible record. The to me, the no one really. You know, to me, record chasing in general has kind of fallen off, and I think fewer people care about tarpon in particular. The tarpon record, uh, I still think there's a there's a little bit of heat on the bass record, but even that is kind of is kind of decreased, and it's uh you know you don't think you see the crazy world record chasers that you used to. Um, so I would say, I mean, if I had to just say the two, I'd still, there are probably more people after the bass record than there are after the tarpon, you know, the, the 16 pound. I mean, do you know anyone who's after the 16 pound tarpon record? I don't. You're right. I don't, Key West. I don't know anybody yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's doing it. I would think that if anybody was doing it, uh, Nathaniel Linville would be the, would be yep. the, the most likely, I mean, maybe some women's records, you know, there yeah. could be some yeah, women that are going after it. That's true. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you, in my, in my record history, it's kind of looking at the book and saying, there's one we think we might be able to get and, yeah. uh, and going after that one, as opposed to saying like Tom Evans, here's the one that is obviously the most challenging in the whole record right. book. Uh, right. like Dell Brown's, what did he have? Like a eight pound permit record, which was, uh, I think it was 40 pounds or something, I mean, a huge one on light tippet. And instead yep. of saying, well, the four pound records vacant, let's go for that. Somebody's yep. saying, I'm going to devote my life to breaking this record right here. And that's a totally different mindset, but there are some yep. people out there, I think that are, that are into it, you know, yep. but I think for I the mean, there are a couple, part, there's still a couple in home assassin, but they are, uh, Let's see one guy's after 16 and then there's like two eight pounders and that's, you know, that, that's about it. Well, the eight pound record opens yourself up to being able to fish other places than home Sassa. Like that's when true. you're looking for the 200 plus, you know, I mean, they're, they yeah. swim, they're, they're around, you know, but you got, you got to go back to Africa, I guess. Yeah, I, mean, I guess. The, I mean, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are, I'm, I'm sure that there are 200 pound fish in the keys that, yep. that you can, conceivably if you fish there long enough and you're out there enough days you might be able to come across one and if you were prepared every single time for 20 years you might have an opportunity to fish like that but that was the thing about home Sassa and the thing about like downtown isla Mirada in the day was that it wasn't a problem finding a record fish they were there right. it's a problem yep. catching them like yep. that was the big bone fish i don't know if you've been watching social media lately but after uh after Andy Mill and Nikki's podcast with Jared Raskob, everybody was posting their pictures of these I saw enormous that. bonefish. I mean, just, and, and it was a crazy time and you got, I mean, there's another story for you. You could do a, you could do a, a, a thing about people chasing those records. I mean, because mm -hmm. that whole tournament scene and those records and the fact that you could just, I mean, literally you, you wouldn't even have to start your motor and go to shell key and you would see those fish. They were there and they were all records or there were plenty of records out there. They were just hard to catch. They were hard to feed. Yeah. And if you yep. did get one, man, it was hard to catch. And, and yep. you know, you had some people that specialized in it that were just awesome at it. And it made for a, it made for a weird little clicky world too, you know? I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, and then, you know, the other, uh, the other thing that's impressive to me about um, Steve Huff is that he, he, you know, kind of left that Homosasa world and then um, 
basically he and Dale Brown created the sport that we know about the called permit fishing today. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they basically created that. I mean, yep. it wasn't a sport before people were like, oh, I see those things all the time. I don't cast right. to them. And then Dale Brown and Steve Huff, they just created that sport and Dale Brown just, you know, it's, that was an interesting time. Also, yep. he's Steve has a great story about, uh, Dell when Dell got older, he went out one time and, you know, Dell was Dell and Steve were perfectly matched a lot like Tom and Tom Evans and Steve Huff, where they both were, you know, totally into the same thing. And it's what kind of animated them. And it's what gave them, you know, purpose. And they just were, they loved it. They went after it. And, you know, Steve fished Dell for years and years and years and years. And then Dell got a little old and he was, I was, he was telling me the story about how he, you know, he, he, one time he pulled like for 40 minutes into a 20 mile an hour headwind and got Dell right to the spot. Dell was like 80 something at this point, right to the spot where, and they were tailing permit and Dell just said, I can't do this, Steve. I have to go home. And Steve tells this really kind of heart wrenching story about how they're riding home like that. And tears are falling down his, oh, no. his face because he realizes that he can't fish with Dell anymore. Uh, and Dell and Dell realized it too. I mean, they were just like, you know, Steve was so, he was, you know, so insatiable at that point. Uh, that he needed, he needed a sport who kind of reached that same level so that they could do that, you know, that, that cool alchemy that happens. Right. But yeah, you know, Steve's one of my heroes. I just love, I, you know, just adore that guy. One of the real just personal problems from this pandemic, which is of course been horrible all the way around, but just personally speaking is I didn't get to go do my trip with Steve this year. Mm. And it was like heartbreaking. And I was like, you know, as you stay with them and I, you know, it's just like, it's the most fun three or four days or some of the most fun three or four days that I have every year. Um, and it's not just about the fishing. Like I, I love fishing those big laid up park in, in the Everglades back there, but it's, it's mainly about the hanging out and yeah. it's just like, listen to this guy tell stories and you know, he's just a, he's just a good dude, you know? And so I just, that bummed me out, but maybe, maybe next year. Yeah. Well, hopefully, I don't know. You're not supposed to miss days like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> hopefully there'll be a, hopefully there'll be a pass for you, uh, because of the pandemic. Yeah, really. Yeah. Well, listen, so, man, um, I, I loved your book. I really, it, it's one of my favorite books that I've read in quite some time. And, uh, congratulations for, for, you know, tackling it, what seems to be a tricky, tricky world to navigate, but yeah. you did it beautifully. And, Good. uh, I give it, I give it super high, high marks and, and enjoyed every, every bit of it. Uh, but thanks for doing the podcast, man. Lots of great Thank stories you. and, and, uh, hope to meet you in person one of these Thank days. You. We'll see That'd each other great. sometime. That'd be great. I'm uh, supposed to come down and fish with Linville at some point. So good. I'll, uh, I'll stop by. All right. But thank you very much. I really do. It really does mean the world when you hear that someone read it. I mean, obviously, you know, especially cause it's not out yet. Well, it's too, not so out it's yet. And I already read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's good to do it. You know, it's just good to, uh, just good positive feedback. I mean, you know, all we're all all writers. Everybody really is like, does anyone gonna like this shit? You know, it's like you never know, right? Till it gets out. So I appreciate that. Very yeah. Much. Well, I mean, I think anybody that that knows this world is going to be fascinated with the stories. And and even if you're, I mean, even if you just like know Key West, like there's enough history about Key West that is interesting and not not well documented in in the book that that people mm-hmm. are going to get plenty of. Yeah. Plenty of good stuff out of that, but uh, tell us about it because um, I already had a couple of people on social media say uh, I can't find it. I don't know where it is, so I guess it's in pre-release phase right now. You can pre-order yeah, so it. How how would so somebody get it? Uh, you can go to uh, Amazon would probably be the easiest place, but also BarnesandNoble dot com. Uh, it's not in stores quite yet. It will be in a couple of weeks, um, and or good re- or, you know, indie bound or something like that just go and you can pre-order it and you'll get it. I think you get it on the 1st of September, which is its release date. You might get it a couple of days afterwards, but um, you know, just go ahead and order it and then you'll have it for the fall. Awesome. The book my- is, is Lords of the fly. Cool name. Love that name. Actually Lords of the fly madness, obsession in the hunt for world record tarpon, highly suggested Monty Burke. Um, that's awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, you, if you guys uh, want to, do you have social media? I do. What what is it? What I, if somebody wants to follow you? Um, I'm on Twitter. It's pretty easy to find on Twitter. I don't really Instagram all that much, but I'm on it. But and, and then I have a Facebook page as well. But it just I think it's uh, just at Monty Burke is my Twitter handle. Okay. All right. So if you want to follow him there, do that. And I see that you're you you seem to be in the process of growing a beard. Are you working on a new book? Are you in the are you in the uh, phases of uh, of introversion? I am. I just got 
I just got my hair cut. Actually, it was but down to here. I went, had to go to Central Park. And I got it outside by this great dude. He's wearing like a pink suit, and he came over and cut my hair. It was awesome. But yeah, I just just started a new book uh, actually on Saturday. So uh, this is a little. I grew it in anticipation, but yeah, it's coming in a good. Very thing. cool. No, but um, this is. I'm, I'm in the extrovert part, so I'm gonna have to shave this off tomorrow <laughs> when I go interview people. So. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a it's a delicate balance and a fine line yep. to walk. Good luck with that. All right, man. Thanks, Thanks so much. I appreciate right, your time. Thank you very much. We'll see you guys next week. All right. Appreciate it. See you later. Awesome.